Well, good good morning, IEC. Uh, for those I haven't met, my name is Pastor Steve, and just want to welcome you here to IEC. We're glad to see you today. If um, uh, if you've been with us, we've been in Matthew's Gospel, and we've been in it actually for a few years. We'll come to it, then we'll go and maybe go to an Old Testament book or a letter of Paul or somewhere. But right now, we are in a section of Matthew, Matthew chapter 13. And in Matthew 13, Jesus gives eight parables. And Because here's what's happened. Jesus came. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior. And Israel had been waiting for Messiah. And in chapter 12, when Jesus does a miracle, he heals, he casts a demon out of a mute man. And everybody thinks this must be Messiah. Only Messiah can do that miracle. And the religious leaders, what's called the Sanhedrin, the official ruling body of Israel, they look and they say, he doesn't do that by God's power. It's by the power of Beelzebub. And the nation, the leadership of the nation, officially rejects Jesus as Messiah, says his works are by Satan. And at that point, Jesus begins to speak in parables. Now, we've all, if you've been in church any length of time, you've heard Jesus' parables. You know that word, and you probably even know what they are. What a parable is, is it's meant to be a very practical story that comes alongside of a truth that God wants you to get. And when we talk about parables, sometimes we'll miss the main point of a parable. Sometimes people will read way too much into a parable. Most of the parables Jesus gives have one huge main point that he wants us to get. So parables are meant to come alongside, and these parables, Jesus has been rejected, and now he's given these parables that teach them what is God's kingdom going to be like. Because that's where everybody's wondering. Okay, kingdom of God was supposed to come when Messiah's coming. What's this kingdom going to look like? And Jesus is explaining it to those who will hear. So today, we're going to, of these eight parables in chapter 13, we're going to see three of them. And these parables are all about the kingdom. In fact, we often miss this. When we read the Bible, when we read the Gospels, one of the main things everybody's wondering in Israel is, when is the kingdom coming? You know what the last question the disciples asked Jesus? The last question that they asked Jesus before he ascends into heaven, Acts chapter 1, verse 6, they say to Jesus, hey, is now... Now when you're going to restore the kingdom, Jesus? The disciples even were wondering, when is this going to happen? So don't miss how huge of idea the kingdom of heaven, also called the kingdom of God, how big that is to the first century nation of Israel. All are wondering. And you know when they ask Jesus, hey, is the kingdom coming now? Jesus tells them this. It's not for you to know the time or the place when the kingdom will come. Our Father in heaven knows that. But then he tells them this. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That was Jesus' intent for the kingdom, is that the kingdom would go to the ends of the earth. So again, they're asking this question today. Jesus has just said, those who you think are a part of a kingdom aren't. And they're wondering, what's going to happen to these unbelievers? So he's going to seek to answer that question. Now, a couple of definitions I gave you three weeks ago. What is the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God? Real quick, real simple definition. It's the redemptive reign and rule of God in Christ. Kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is the redemptive reign and rule of God in Jesus Christ. And Jesus says that there's a mystery to this kingdom, meaning they've been waiting for the kingdom, 
They have a vision in their mind of what it looks like, and Jesus is saying, there's a mystery. There's some things that you do not understand about the kingdom. So here's what we're going to see today. We're going to see three parables. Jesus will give a long parable, then two very, very short parables. He'll talk about why he gives parables, and then he'll explain the first parable. So let's stand for uh, God's word. We're in Matthew chapter 13. We'll be reading verses 24 through 43. 24 through 43. It reads, he put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds also appeared. And the servant of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did we not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then what do you want us to, uh, to go and gather them? And he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, it will tell, will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, bind them in bundles, and burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. He put another parable for them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of seeds, but when it had grown, it is larger than all the garden plants, and it becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make their nest in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. All these things Jesus said to, them, said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Then he left the crowds, and he went into the house, and the disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the, of the field. And Jesus answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the close of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of the kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fire fir fiery furnace in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father he who has ears let him hear this is the word of god for the people of god and all god's people said praise be to god you may be seated God, we do thank you for your word. Your word is good. Your word declares that we're all like grass, that all of our glories like the flowers of the field, the grass withers and the flowers fade. But Lord, it is your word that stands forever. We ask that this be the word preached today. We recognize unless you speak through your word and through your servant, nothing of any eternal significance will be spoken. So speak, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. The first parable we get is often called the parable of the weeds. The parable of the weeds. And it, it's a picture of both the age we're in and of the end of the age. Because remember, everyone thought, if you're of the nation of Israel, you will be a part of the kingdom. And if you're not of Israel, you won't be a part of the kingdom. That was the thinking of the day. And Jesus is saying, wait a minute. Not everyone that you think is a part of the kingdom will actually be a part of the kingdom. 
And there are some who you think have no opportunity to be a part of the kingdom who will be. It's a mystery. They didn't understand it. He's speaking it to them in parables, and he gives them the story of the parable of the weeds. And at the end of our reading today, he explains in detail what everything represents. Three weeks ago, we looked at the parable right before this, the parable of the sower. And Jesus did the same thing. He explained all the details of the parable. But notice, these three parables we read today are given with crowds around. Everybody's there that wants to hear. But when he explains it, he explains it in private. He explains it in a house. Most likely, people say he was probably in Capernaum and he was in Peter's house explaining the disciples wanted to know what this parable is about, and Jesus, in private, explains it to them. Why? Because those with eyes for the kingdom, those with ears to hear, they will hear the parable and understand. Yet those who don't have it, they'll hear the parable and will not understand. So his disciples want to make sure they understand what is going on in this parable and Jesus explains to them the sower the one who goes and sows this seed in the parable that's the son of man that's Jesus Jesus comes into the field now he says in verse 38 the field represents the world so the son of man Jesus Christ comes into the world and he is sowing good seed what is good seed Well, he says the good seed is sons of the kingdom. For us, put simply, those are Christians. He's sowing good seed. That's what Jesus is doing. Seeing people come to trust him, believe him, say, you're Messiah, follow him, worship him. But then there's a problem. The enemy. He says very clearly, Jesus says the enemy is the devil. And the devil comes and he sows weeds. He comes and he sows weeds and he says these weeds are the sons of the devil, the sons of evil, the sons of the world. Then as we might call them, those who haven't trusted Christ, non-Christians, people who are lost. That's who he says he These are both sown together, good seed, believers, non-believers, in this world, growing together. And we see that the harvesters, they come, the reapers, they come and they say, hey, should we pull up the weeds? Now, if you've ever done any gardening, how much effort does it take to get a weed to grow? doesn't take very much does it in fact it takes a lot of effort to kill the weeds right you have to fight the weeds you have to get rid of the weeds you have to be aggressive and to get good plants to grow it takes careful watering careful care for them to become what they're supposed to come become so they're thinking we want to get rid of the weeds and keep the good grain the good crop But Jesus tells them this in the parable. You can't tell them apart. Your eyes can't tell who is who. You might pull up and getting rid of a weed, you might pull up some good grain, a good seed. So here's what you've got to do. Let them both grow. Let them both grow till that day comes when judgment's to come. They'll be gathered, and at that point, you can tell them apart. You see, Jesus often talks about the wheat and the tares. Well, they're they're almost impossible to tell apart to the naked eye. When you look at them, you go, I can't, can't tell which is which. But when you sift them, meaning the idea is you would go on top of a hill, there'd be a breeze blowing, and you would take the wheat The tares, the weeds, they would all be there together and you would throw them in the air and the wheat has enough weight that it falls to the ground. 
the weeds, they have no real substance, and they'll blow away. So that was the process. And Jesus saying, a day is coming when they will gather the weeds, they'll bind them in bundles, and those will be burned. They're going to be dealt with. Don't worry. But for now, they're going to grow together. This is a picture of our present age that we live in. This is the world we live in. Christians, non-Christians, living side by side in houses, working side by side in workplaces, living life together, seeing each other, knowing one another, growing together. And he's saying sometimes you can't tell the difference. Now we think, it should be obvious if a person's a Christian. And I would say, absolutely. If a person is a Christ follower, we should really have no questions. It should be obvious by how they live, what they say, what they do, who they are. It should be obvious, this person is a Christian. And typically, those who don't know the Lord, they should be easy to tell. They don't care about the Lord. They don't care about the things of the Lord. They don't want much to do with God. They should be easy to tell as well. And yes, often it is. Sometimes it's easy as a person will say, I'm not a Christian. And you'll go, okay, gotcha, we know that. The picture here is those who both, everybody looks at and goes, they're all together. They all appear to be a part of the same kingdom. You see, in what we call the church, I'm using the universal church, the worldwide invisible church body of Christ. Growing together are those who have truly repented of their sin and trusted Jesus Christ and, born, and are born again. There's also those who come, say, yes, I'm a Christian. They claim to be a part, but they haven't truly trusted Christ. And we can't always tell the difference. And he's saying, hey, it's not even really your responsibility to go and tell the difference. You don't have to be looking going, they're a Christian, they're not a Christian. Obviously, if somebody tells us they're not, we're going to trust them on that. If somebody tells us they are and their lifestyle matches, we're trusting them on that. But here's, we all know this. We all know people like this, every one of us. They say, yes, I'm a Christian. But if you looked at the way they live, it's inconsistent with the person who's converted. If you listen to how they talk, it's inconsistent with the person who's converted. If you look at how they treat people, it's inconsistent with the person that's converted. And you go, are they a Christian or are they not? He's saying that's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to keep preaching that gospel to them. Keep telling them Jesus is sufficient because here's the thing. If it's a Christian living in sin, what do they need? Repent of your sin and run back to Jesus. If it's a person who thinks they're a Christian, but they're really not, and they're living in sin, what do they need? Repent of your sin and turn to Jesus. They all need the same thing. So what's your role? Keep preaching the gospel. Keep preaching the gospel. You don't have to distinguish that. Now, Pastor Mike talked about we have membership class coming up. Why do we have a membership class? Why do churches have membership? Well, here's the idea behind church membership. Scripture tells the elders. In Hebrews chapter 13, 17, it says that elders are keeping watch over the souls of those who are part of the church. Okay? That's probably the most heavy responsibility that is given to church leadership. Keep watch over the souls of the people in the church. Feels heavy, feels daunting. We can't do it perfectly. And when you're a part of the church, guess what the, we're telling you? You're a part of the body of Christ. And when we say, what is it, how do you become a part of the body of Christ? Repent of your sin, trust Jesus. So when someone joins a church, that church is telling them, maybe in a very overt way, maybe in a very subtle way, we believe, as far as we can tell, that you've trusted Jesus. That's why we have a membership process where we 
say what we believe, we teach what we believe, we talk about our church, we answer questions. And then one of the final things we do in our membership process is those who want to be members meet with some of our elders. And that meeting is simply to hear this. Does this person give this testimony of someone who's trusted Jesus? Our elders can't tell that perfectly. They're not trying to. But when you say to somebody, hey, what does it mean to be a Christian? Or how did you become a Christian? People often tell us this. Well, I was born going to church. Is that in our Bible? If you're, if you're born going to church, you're a Christian. Nowhere. Nowhere. Nobody is born a Christian. You're born again a Christian, but you're not born a Christian. So when we hear that, we go, okay, you said you were born going to church. Well, tell me what it means, because I'm going, that's not the testimony of a Christian. What does it mean to be a Christian? Or what is the gospel? I often ask that question. Well, the gospels are the, the story of Jesus, okay? Does that mean you're a Christian? No. Here's what makes you a Christian. I've recognized I'm a sinner. And I have no hope. And I throw myself on Jesus' mercy. He lived the life I could not live. He died the death I deserved in my place. That's where my hope is, is in Jesus. And when we trust that, Scripture says we're a new creation. We're born again. Something's different about us. Holy Spirit comes and resides in us. That's a Christian. And all our elders look to do, we don't come out of those meetings going, hey, they're a Christian, they're not a Christian. We can't do that. But here's what we do. Their story, the words that come from their mouth, sound like that of a Christian. Therefore, we're going to welcome men. Sometimes people will say, the words that came out of their mouth, we don't know if they're a Christian or not, but they don't seem to match. We need to disciple them, invest in them more, spend time with them more. Does that make sense? It's, our elders can't police who's a Christian and who's not. Scripture says we're not to do that. In fact, I, I guess that's not our role. But when you join a church, if someone says, hey, I'm a Christian, I've always gone to church my whole life, and that makes me a Christian, you don't understand the gospel. That's not the gospel. Maybe you just can't explain it very well. There's a lot of people like that. So here's what we're to do. We don't know who's a Christian and not always. Some people clearly say they're not. Some people clearly we have evidence that they are. But at the end of the day, that is God's job. Okay? That's God's role. We can be discerning. You can look at a friend who says, I'm a Christian. And you can, out of love, say this because you love them. You know your lifestyle doesn't match that of a Christian. I love you. I'm concerned about you. But we don't know if they're really a Christian or not. They may be a Christian caught in sin. They may be a Christian who's drifted, or they may not be. All we can say is your lifestyle, what you say, the testimony of your mouth, doesn't match that of a follower of Jesus. And Jesus is saying here, at the end, there's coming a time when he's going to deal with this. He's going to separate these things out. Jesus will do that, okay? Angels will gather up, up the wheat and the weeds. They'll separate it. And one of the most harsh realities of Scripture, I don't like this. I don't think anybody really likes this. But it says, The Son of Man will send His angels, they'll gather up the kingdom, sinners and lawbreakers. And they'll be thrown into the fiery furnace where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's a description of hell. It's not something we take lightly. It should make us uncomfortable. I don't like talking about hell. I don't like hell. In fact, I wish, if, if I were to make it, I wish Scripture said, hey, end of the day, that doesn't exist. The Bible says, I'm not God. I don't get to decide. I'm under the authority of Scripture. And Scripture teaches that those who do not trust in Christ they're like those weeds who grow. And at the end, there'll be a separation. 
That's what the Bible teaches. It's not up to us to decide, do I like it, do I not like it? What God said. God's word. And Jesus says, you're not the ultimate one to decide that. Now again, I think it's wise when you see a loved one, a friend, who appears to live a life that's not as a Christian. They may say they are, but it's kind of the wrong way to say, I love you too much. I want to see your testimony of what you say, who you say you are in your life match. And here's the reality. If we took a snapshot just this week of your worst moment, your very worst moment this week, put it up here on the screen. Everybody would look and go, that's not how a follower of Christ behaves. You know? So we all still struggle with sin, but ultimately God knows those who are His. He sees that. He understands that. Now, Jesus gives two more short parables because here's what he's saying. Who's in the kingdom, who's not? You can't fully tell. The weed and the wheats look the same. And then he gives a short parable about a mustard seed. A mustard seed. It's the size of a speck of pepper. Okay? That's how small a mustard seed is. It's tiny. About the size of a speck of pepper. And yet when you plant it, it grows into one of the largest trees in Israel. It's huge. But yet it starts very, very, very small. And here's what Jesus is speaking of. The kingdom is going to grow outwardly. The kingdom is going to be huge. But it starts very small. Jesus' ministry goes like this. He gains a following Many people follow, and from the feeding of the 5,000 onward, we'll see that, that's in chapter 14, crowds become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until on the day of Pentecost there's only 120 gathered believers. It starts very small. And he's saying, hey, the kingdom's going to start really, really small. You're going to look at it and think, this can't have any impact 120 people? There's no way they can make a difference. And those 120 people are going to impact the entirety of the world. Statistics tell us that today there are over 3 billion people who claim to be Christians on earth. Now again, sort of like the parable we just saw, some of those are definitely Christians, some probably aren't. But 3 billion Three and a half billion have been seen of eight billion people on earth claim to be Christians. That's a large number. So obviously this kingdom has expanded. How did this happen? Through faithful people who went and shared. I heard the story of a man who was going from Tyre. It's in present day Lebanon. It's mentioned in the Bible. And he was going to go from Tyre and he was going to go to India to share the gospel. That was his mission. And he took his two younger nephews with him, and they're going to India to share the gospel. But on this journey from Tyre in present-day Lebanon to India, they stopped at a port, and it was at that port that all the men were killed, all their items taken. And it was only the two nephews that were allowed to live. The king took those nephews into his service, made them his slaves. The king realized these two young men had a gift of teaching, and at the king's uh, death, his widow, the queen, said, I want you to teach my son. He's going to be the next king when he's of age. I want you to teach him. And he taught that young son, and when that young son would become king, named King Azana, he ruled the Aksumite Empire, he would have come to faith through the teaching and preaching of that 
young teacher from Tyre. That led to the kingdom of Abyssinia of Ethiopia declaring itself Christian in 328. Only one nation declared themselves Christian before Ethiopia. That was in 322, whenever... Um, oh, um, it'll come to me in a minute. <laughs> Can't think. But this was the second nation to declare itself Christian right here in Ethiopia. They came to what they thought they were going to India. Instead, God had different plans. And what we see is that that kingdom continued to spread all over the world. All over the world, the kingdom came, this message. Now, you're probably thinking, yeah, the kingdom message came. But at some point, the robust preaching of the gospel became muted within the church here. Many of you know that. Many of you, that's your history. You've seen that. That's where the, the next parable comes in. So this parable, Jesus says, starts small, becomes huge, like a giant tree. The next parable, look at this. One verse parable. Kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Now, typically, leaven is a picture of sin in the Bible. Because here's what sin does. Starts very small, and it completely takes over. Leaven is not used as a picture of sin here. Leaven is a picture of the kingdom of heaven. And what it does, you put a little leaven in a large lump, and the leaven takes over. That word leaven in the English, it comes from our English word levitate. Levitate means to raise up to float upward, because that's what leaven does. It expands. But leaven does this. It changes what it goes into. Fundamentally, completely changes it, transforms it. That's what leaven does. So you put leaven in flour, that flour is no longer the same. That's what the kingdom of heaven is to do in the world. You put the kingdom of heaven... Heaven people, and again, we believe the kingdom of heaven is an already not yet kingdom. Meaning, it's here, Jesus brought it in, but it's not in its full. When Jesus returns, we'll have a full kingdom. Until then, we are the kingdom people. But you drop kingdom people into the world, and they'll start to change it. That's the way it's meant to happen. A little leaven transforms it. So, he's talking about inner growth here inner growth. Now sometimes, remember he talked about in the kingdom, you've got weeds and you've got wheat growing together. Sometimes the weed takes over. You know that can happen in a church? You get the wrong people in, in charge. You get the weeds running the church. They claim to be a Christian, but they're out for some other reason. And it corrupts the whole thing. That's what can happen. That's why he talks about, after he talks about the kingdom becoming huge, he says the kingdom's got to be permeated by the truth. The truth of God, who that is. So here's what's to happen with kingdom people. If you're a Christian, God intends for everything that you're involved with to be blessed by you, by what God has done in your life. In your neighborhood, your neighbors should look and go, praise God that they're our neighbors. They're making such a difference in our neighborhood. The people you work with should look and go, hey, we work with some difficult people. And here's the thing I know, if you work anywhere, you work with some difficult people because we're all a little difficult, right? So we can say that. I'm not pointing at anybody. But here's the thing. We're intended to make things better. Praise God, I get to work with them. I'm so glad they're on my team. I'm so glad I work with them. Praise God, that's what we're to do. We're to make things better. In our friendships, friendships can get tricky. 
Sometimes friendships get hard. No, the Christian is the one who's to make the friendship better. To sacrifice, to love, to lay down. See, everywhere we go, every place we do, we're to make things better because of what Christ has done in our life. That's who we're to be. We're to be that leaven out in this world. We're not to be buying into the corruption of society, playing the same games that other people who, whether they say they're Christian or not, they fall into. No, we're to be different. See, what leaven also does to bread It sweetens it. So bread is to have a a slight sweet taste to it. And the bread sweetens it. That's what we're to do. We're to be the flavor of the world, to sweeten this world, to be kinder, more loving. That's who we're to be. As you grow, as God matures you and grows you, you should become more and more loving. You know, they say as, as a person gets older, they become more who they truly are. You'll see some old people that'll be really grumpy and really rude, and you're just like, ah, oh, that's awful. Nobody wants to be around them, but they feel the freedom. I've lived my life, so I can behave how I want to. Now oh, the Christian grows. The Christian becomes older, they become sweeter, more loving, more gracious, more kind. People are drawn to them. People want to be around them because of their graciousness, their kindness, and who they are. See, that's, that's what we're to be. We're to be that leaven. So in these parables, he's painting a picture of what the kingdom looks like. Who we're to be, how we're to be in this kingdom. Now, Jesus explains these parables. He says these things have been hidden. It's a mystery. Some people don't understand this. This kingdom is not just for Israel. It's going to all the world. And that's the glorious good news. It's gone to all the world. Now, we know there's plenty of places where the gospel is hard to get into. You know, the truth, when it talks about that little seed becoming a massive tree, the gospel has made its way to all the world. Now, there's people that still haven't received it. There's those who haven't believed. There's those who want to take it there. The way people stop the gospel from coming into their areas now is they legislate, they fight, they kill. The places where the gospel hasn't gone are typically the hardest places on earth. They don't want you coming. They don't want Christians there. They've rejected it. You know, interesting, we're in one of the areas, I saw this, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on this, that this area of the world, the Horn of Africa, has had more fighting than any other area of the world. I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, it's a stat I saw, but I give it to you cautiously because stats aren't always true. But here's what I look at. This is one of the first places the gospel came. Yet we're surrounded by unbelievers who have rejected the gospel, who have not trusted this message. In fact, even after the church was established, we see missionaries came here because the church had lost, in many places, an understanding of the gospel. We want to see the church revive. We want to see the church strengthen. We want to see the church grow. That's our prayer. But it's my hope and prayer that we who live here, who call this place home, who God has called here, we have the opportunity We're surrounded by those who have not heard the glorious good news of the gospel. And God has called you. I can say this with 100% certainty. If you are a Christian, you are called to ministry. Maybe not like I am where I'm a vocational minister, but you are called to minister, to be a minister of the gospel right where you are. We firmly believe in the priesthood of all believers. And I believe it's as the church, the body of Christ, begins to be that sweet leaven in their work, in their neighborhood, right where they are, that we're going to see this tree, this glorious tree of the kingdom, continue to grow. That's what we want to see. We read this verse, weeping and gnashing of teeth at the end times. We don't want that. 
We want to see more and more trust the sweet, glorious message of the gospel. Today we're going to celebrate communion. I'm going to go ahead and call some of our leaders forward. Three tables in the back, three tables in the front, and three in the back, two in the balcony. And the way we do communion here, you come and get the bread, you come and get the juice, and then together, you just take them back to your seat, we stand and we take communion together. And we do that to remind ourselves of this truth. Though we're many generations, many nations, many tongues, we are one in Christ Jesus. So I'm going to pray, and the communion tables are open to all who have trusted in Jesus. Let's pray. God, we thank you for these parables of Jesus about the kingdom. Lord, forgive us for the times that we felt that we're to be the judge when you're the ultimate judge. Lord, forgive us for not celebrating the growth of the kingdom. Forgive us for not being the leaven that impacts all the areas you've placed us. Lord, we've all failed at that sum and we've all done well. Lord, may we continue to sweeten the places where you've placed us with the glorious message of the gospel. So Lord, now as we celebrate communion, maybe a celebration that you've made a way for us to enter the kingdom, for us to be a, what we call a Christian because we've trusted in Jesus. We pray this in his precious name. Amen.